Well, the ups and downs of the monorail with Joel Horn, the director of it all, tonight on Public Exposure. I'm Stan Emmert, and this is a true treat because not only is this the beginning of the new season right here on SCAN Primetime, but we have certainly one of the most important projects that the city of Seattle has ever had, and the guy who's in charge, Joel Horn. Joel, welcome to the show. Thank you. So you've been having fun? Well, I love it. I mean, Good. it isn't every day you get the opportunity to build something like this, so it's really fun. Before we go too far, there's a ton of information on your website. I wanted to get the website up, uh, www.elevated.org. We're going to get a graphic up several times throughout the, the show about that. Um, so, I mean, actually, there's a lot of information there and a lot of new things happening. Well, we, have a, we try to put as much as we can on the website. The most recent additions have been a lot of our financial information because people are really interested in the fi finances of the organization. Seem to be. So we have a lot of that information up so people can go to elevated.org and see that. Also, uh, at the April board meeting, we gave a, an update on where we are with the negotiations. So if people go to the website and click on the board meetings, they can actually see the board meeting from April where we gave our progress report. Okay, now let's let's uh, ask a few hard questions because okay. uh, the print media has been asking them as well. Let's go to, uh, I believe it was April 7th uh, in the Seattle PI. The headline was the new monorail could be delayed a year. The project agency says the contract talks on the bid could last until July. And Michael Taylor Judd, the president of Friends of the Monorail, was quoted as saying, we're nowhere near being on time. He said, chiding board members for not seeming more concerned about delays. That's one article. Let's go forth to earlier this month. Uh, the, uh, again, out of the Seattle PI, this was an editorial. Headline, monorail project, fish or cut bait? And the statement in there was, if it can be built as promised and on budget, the 14-mile monorail system will be a crucial and easily justified investment in regional mobility. But flip assurances and casual dismissals of looming concerns are no longer sufficient. One more article, then no I'll problem. let you have your say. That's fine. Uh, the Seattle Times, monorails closed tent. This is May 2nd. It says that almost every turn, monorail officials have an answer. Everything is hunky-dory, backed up by very little helpful information. So, Joe, are you flippant and glib? <laughs> well, first of all, um, I think a lot of what these articles are saying are correct. So I'm not going to refute it very much. First of all, let's take the first one. I mean, we are delayed, and I don't think anyone is more worried about that than we are. Um, we would like to be under construction as soon as we possibly can. We don't like the fact that it's taken longer uh, to negotiate this contract. Um, but it's important that we take our time right now. We have to be very, very deliberate to get these negotiations right uh, because we have to live with this contract for a long time. It's a very well, long marriage we're going to have. I've got my my free pass for my first day. Is it still going to happen on that day? Well, the free passes that we passed out, we talked about it opening on 2007, a small portion of the of it, just a mile and a half, and that isn't going to happen. And and we've been very public about that uh, that that wouldn't happen. Um, but those uh, free passes, of course, will be honored uh, when we do open it up. Um, and, and for us, you know, we've set very, very high expectations uh, for our staff and for the city. And so on some of them, we haven't been able to meet them. And, you know, we wanted to uh, break ground within two years of when the voters approved the monorail. And it looks now, if it does take another year, like it would be three years instead of two. And again, no one is more concerned about that than us. But if it does take another year, um, I still believe that taking three years from when the voters approved it to starting construction is still very fast when compared to other projects of its type around the country. Let me go on with what the Seattle Times had to sure. say in that article. Uh, they add, the city has a duty to protect the public from a project that may be doomed. Again, this is the Seattle Times editorial opinion. The city council will do a financial analysis of the project after details of the contract and the proposed financing plan are released. Let's get going. Let's open the tent of secrecy so the public can get a sense as to whether this behemoth project is real or not. Uh, that's pretty strong criticism from uh, a, a newspaper that begrudgingly gave some support, has given support in the past. Well, again, I have to say that I agree with most of what they say. I mean, first of all, uh, the city does have a duty to protect those rights away, those public streets, and uh, we've worked very hard with the city. Uh, we have a great relationship with them, 
and they, uh, we've agreed to an independent financial review of our finances and of the plan after the contract is agreed to. And what the City Council is going to look at is they're going to look at if we start construction, can we finish construction and operate it for the first five years? That's what the City Council has asked the independent reviewers to look at. Now, I can assure you we're not going to negotiate a contract that we can't finish. We're not going to do that. However, I think that the city uh, reviewing that is absolutely appropriate, so I have no problem with that. When you get to the other part about the tent of secrecy, you know, these aren't secret negotiations. Everyone knows they're going on. It's not secret, it's private. And that's very, very different. And the reason that they're in private is that those negotiations can't be done through the media. We're negotiating on behalf of the public, and our job is to take those tens of thousands of comments and all those public meetings we've had, and we bring them to the negotiating table every day. And our job, working for the public, is to negotiate the best possible monorail we can for the city of Seattle, and that's what we do every day in those private negotiations. We believe that we'll get the best value by doing those negotiations in private. Now, one thing, it is really painful. It's painful for the people who aren't in the negotiations, folks who care deeply about the project and don't know what's happening in those negotiations. It's very painful and it's difficult for us because we've been so open about what we've been doing. Uh, we think we set new examples of transparency and openness and then all of a sudden we go into private negotiations. So it's painful for us. You're going to ask questions tonight that I'm going to want to answer and I'm going to have to say I'm sorry but we're still in private negotiations. Well, the um, the Times and the PI, I think, spanked the monorail just a little bit, mm -hmm. at least in their view, because there was some pretty big news yesterday. I mean, I thought it was big news. Uh, and if I mean, tell us about the, the fact that you have approved the Cascadia project. Well, the Cascadia um, team is the team that we're negotiating with. It's the group of 25 to 30 companies, private companies that are on the other side of the negotiating table. Mm -hmm. If we complete the contract negotiations, hopefully when we complete the contract negotiations, then they become our partner and they become our partner for a very long time. And Cascadia asked for a reorganization of their team. And because they lost a big part of it. There was a, there was one of their 25 to 30 members that had left the team. But it, it wasn't was a just major, one. Was well, major. it was a major partner that yeah. left the team and it was one of the two uh, organizing partners okay. and so they asked to leave the team and what we had to do on the public side was make sure that the remaining team members were qualified to do the job mm -hmm. so we went through a very rigorous process uh, to make sure they were still qualified and we've determined that they are so and so we've got a we've got a qualified entity that's ready to go absolutely. forward is, upon completion of negotiations and you announced that yesterday and here's the coverage that was in the Seattle Times let's see on the front page, was it here? No, there was Hawaii's campaign for a carrier could create waves in Everett. <laughs> Prostate cancer study urges surgery for men under 65. And let's go to the front page of the local section. The tide brings in slimy treasures. Now, here though, I did find it here in the Seattle Times, buried in the back. Let's see where was it? Well, it was right next to, if we can get this, a picture of a construction uh, debacle. Do you think that there, might, Avenue. You know, there yeah. might have been any kind of juxtaposition on purpose there? <laughs> That's that one. And I, I want to go to the PI, and so this is going to be a little bit of a rough transition, uh, transition on television. But going to the PI, let's see. Here's their front page. It's not a dumpster. It's a lifetime. So there's that. So not on the, on the front page. Now let's see. Let's go to the front page of the local section. Now let's see. Uh, well, the East Lake Sammamish Trail was applauded. I like the trail. Yeah, I like the trail too, but uh, maybe, you know, a $1.5 billion dollar project. And let's see where they put it here. Oh, there's obituaries. Uh -huh. And right here it is about... But we're not in the obituaries. No, you're not in the obituaries. Okay. So um, I guess my, my point here is is that they don't think you're transparent or there's some kind of... Uh, it, the Times and the PI, and you know what? Whether we like it or not, print media in a city our size are important. Well, you know, I think that for the for the print media, it's been very frustrating. The, we've gotten to know the reporters quite well. They come to our meetings. Uh, they put a lot of work into this, um, spend a lot of time with us. And 
you know, for two years, three years, we could meet with them, answer their questions. We've even at times had them into our meetings. But then we go into these private negotiations, and all we can say is, you know, sorry, but we can't tell you what's going on, and we think that's in the public's best interest. They don't like that, and, uh, and I don't blame them because they're not getting the kind of news and information they need. But they will as soon as we can go public with the contract. Okay, we've got a lot of things to cover that I want that I want to cover, but I got to ask these three questions. Okay. Number one: Is the monorail financing plan feasible? Uh, first of all, yes. Second of all, it has to be, and the reason is is that uh, the voters gave us funding limits, and we must do a contract. We must negotiate a contract that comes in within our funding limits. We have no ability to go outside of those limits. So it is feasible and it will be feasible or we won't bring it forward for approval. Next question. Have cuts in services, stations, cars, whatever, routes been made to make the monorail project appear affordable? Well, this is a question we get asked a lot and the answer is, the answer is no. Uh, we've been asked, is it still 14 miles? Yes, we've been very public about the fact that we're getting the whole system, the whole 14 mile system, great monorail trains, automated technology, very safe, very dependable. But still, even today, we had a newspaper reporter uh, call up and say, well, are you sure it's gonna be 14 miles? And see, and this is because we haven't shown the final contract yet, People can't be sure until we show it to them, but I can guarantee you if it's not uh, the full 14-mile system, we won't be bringing it to the board for approval. Third question, the Coalition for Effective Transportation, uh, it's a nonprofit uh, group here in the area, says that Sound Transit Sounder um, cost $62,000 per rider in 2004. How much will the monorail cost? You know, because we're in the private discussions right now about cost, We'll be able to give you that answer soon when we're finished with private negotiations. But one thing I want to say about Sound Transit and Sounder is that we're working very closely to integrate with those systems. Mm -hmm. And there'll be a day when people will get off Sounder, they'll get onto the monorail, and they'll take the monorail to where they're going. So the systems work together with each other. They will have very different cost structures, however. That's heavy rail, we're monorail, and so they cost different amounts of money. Well, let's certainly hope that it's not $62,000 per rider. I anyway. can pretty much guarantee you it won't be. <laughs> All right, now let's let's get on to some other things. We're not even going to do a halftime. We're just going, we're going straight ahead. There is a video that has been produced uh, okay. through uh, the Elevated Group, and, and the video, it goes back and forth three different times. Right. And if it's if it's ready, we'd like for you to be able to watch it sure. and look for different things three different times if you can. Are we ready to go with that? One, two, three, go. Okay, it's not working, so we're gonna we're gonna work on that. Let's I hope go we to can some, come back to that. Yeah, we're gonna try to. Let's go to some pictures, though, because this is a, a this next thing is a picture from Las Vegas. It was during the construction phase. Mm -hmm. And I kind of wanted to ask you, is this the way it's going to look? Let's go to this first picture if we can get that up. Las Vegas monorail during construction. And let's go to the next inset um, as, we, as we see. Basically what I'm, I'm trying to say is, is it going to be that easy for us during construction where cars are going to continue to go for it? Well, building a monorail is significantly easier than, than many other things because you pour the foundations, put the columns in place, and then we can put the beams up, and once you put the beams up, a lot of the work can happen from up top. Um, you'll find that we'll be less disruptive, I think, than people are thinking for a major system. Right. However, you know, it still is going to have some disruption while we're doing the construction. Okay, I understand that the video is ready, so let's go to the video again. It's gonna go back and forth three times. Watch it closely. see the glass on the front so you'll be able to see out the front and back of the train. Um, this is a, a picture of it running at about 60 feet above the ground as it goes north mm -hmm. of the grassy area at the Seattle Center. From a noise standpoint, will it be about as noisy as the, uh, as the one that has existed here in Seattle for 40 years? It, it'll be either that quiet or quieter. But it is quieter than a city bus. Yeah, that and, is a very uh, quiet. And, and, and especially here when it's so high, 60 feet above the ground, 
you know, it gets quieter as it gets further away from the ground. Now, of course, as the video is done, and I want to go back to some pictures of construction. And okay. this, this next picture of construction, and we're going to have some arrows. Again, this is from Las Vegas, and I wanted to ask if, is, if this is the way it's going to look. And see how it is not necessarily centered as the arrows uh, show that. Is that the way ours is going to look? It depends on where it is, Stan. Uh, this is, do you have the ability to cantilever or load the top, that top piece is called the crosshead, mm -hmm. and you've got the ability to shift it to the left or the right on the column or have it be centered on the column. And it gives you some flexibility as you go through different parts of town. One thing we have to realize is that when it's centered over the column, you get the thinnest column. As you start to cantilever it off one side or the other, the column will be a little larger. So wherever we can, we prefer to have it centered over the column. Uh, and of the 14 miles, do you know right now approximately what percent is going to be? I don't have that percentage right now. I do know that there are, um, we try to keep it centered. So for example, when we're going down the center of a road, it's easier mm -hmm. to keep it centered. It's usually either around a corner or when you're getting close to the property line that you need to, what's called eccentrically load the column. Well, I got a thousand questions and we have 10 minutes. So let's, let's go. see what we keep can do. Going. Uh, let's go to the line itself. We've, we've got the line divided into two different, uh, two different maps. The, the first part is the southern part, mm -hmm. next part is the northern part. Let's go to the southern part first. The project itself, can you just kind of briefly sure. describe it? Sure. Uh, you'll be able to get on the monorail at Morgan Junction in West Seattle, that's the southernmost station, and go up through Alaska Junction. Mm -hmm. And then it goes down by the, where the golf course is in West Seattle on Avalon and then cuts down and there's a station in the Del Ridge community uh, right next to the West Seattle Bridge, sort of where the new core steel plant is. Then it goes up and over the West Seattle Bridge, turns to the... The high bridge. The high bridge. Yeah. So you'll actually, the, and so you can imagine the views are going to be I can pretty wait. spectacular. Um, and also when there's traffic, obviously, on the West Seattle Bridge, like for example, when the viaduct is being rebuilt, um, this won't be affected by the traffic on the bridge, of course. And then when you get off the viaduct, it'll turn to the north and there'll be a station in the area near the Seattle School District and the Starbucks headquarters. Mm -hmm. Then it goes by the stadiums, continues north, and there'll be one near the Mariners you know, Stadium, yep. uh, Safeco Field. And then there'll also be another one at King Street Station, which will be really the intermodal hub for Sounder and light rail and buses and Amtrak, as well as it'll be the station for, uh, for Seahawks Stadium. Okay. Then it'll go further north and, and you'll be able to get off at Pioneer Square, which I think will be a great station to, yeah. where the sinking ship garage is today. And that's actually our closest connection point, the light rail. So if you want to transfer from monorail to light rail or back and forth, that's where your closest connection would be. Then we'll have a, a number of stations downtown, one where the current Federal Reserve is because they've announced yep. that they're moving out of downtown. So mm -hmm. we'll put a station there. Then there'll be one at Pike Place Market so you can go buy you know, your organic vegetables or your fish and uh, get on the monorail. And then uh, we'll turn again and go over to Fifth Avenue where the current monorail is and we'll go in the same corridor and there'll be a station there for the retail core at, uh, between, on Fifth between Stewart and... Um, um, it, uh, well, anyway, there's, there's a station there as well. So how far does, does that go? And then we're going to go to the next, the next it's map. It's very funny. And then the, uh, I know, Virginia. yeah, you're just a director, you just know it backwards and forth. I'm just kidding, that's okay. And then as you go, uh, then as you go further north, there'll be one at uh, Fifth and Bell, right next to where the uh, glass blowing studio is. Mm -hmm. um, then you'll have a station, two stations at Seattle Center. One that'll be right near where the Space Needle is today in the EMP. Then on the other side of Seattle Center, there'll be a station uh, at Key Arena. Okay. Um, and, that'll, and that'll be for the lower Queen Anne community. Then you go down and uh, we have a station down at uh, Mercer and Elliott. Uh, there's a station that we're talking about up at Blaine near Amgen and the Port of Seattle. Um, then there's another one at Dravis. For okay, the well, let's, let's get to the next map. Well, we're already there, so keep So going. then there's one at Dravis, which will be um, in the... So how far north does it go? Well, it goes all the way up into 85th and 15th at Crown Hill in, in the northern part of Allen. Now, all of the stations that there's a, a little circle on these maps, they're they're going to be done, right? Well, what we're negotiating with the uh, with Cascadia about is uh, exactly uh, how many stations and when the stations will be built. And there's been a lot of um, speculation in the press about 
how many of those. Um, we're negotiating to have all of the stations be able to be built and to have the uh, software system and to have the whole monorail system to be able to accommodate all 20 stations. Okay, now let's go to the cars themselves. We've got a picture from Las Vegas which shows a car that is interesting, but it's not our kind of car, though, is it? This is the Bombardier car, the new one, which mm -hmm. they built for Las Vegas. And um, as you can see, uh, it's a great car, has a great design. Um, but it's, it's not ours. It's not the one we're negotiating for, but it's doing quite well in Las Vegas. Let's go to the Cascadia monorail site. Okay. This is their website, and I, this, this is the team that you are negotiating with right That's now. Correct. And they make some claims on their website. And let's go to the first claim is that they claim a safer, more secure vehicle with a walk-through design. Well, what that is about, Stan, is that um, they have a car where you can actually walk, a train where you can mm -hmm. walk from one car to the other. And there. we actually have a picture of that on the inside. So let's, let's see if we can okay. go to that one there. And then that's one, a picture that you took, right? Uh, that's the one that's on their website. I think the one that's yeah. coming up in a couple of slides is the one I took. Oh, I see. But the, see, the, a little bit of oh, the difference between the trains is the Bombardier train in Las Vegas, you can't walk from car to car. They're segmented cars. Mm -hmm. um, some people feel that that's actually better. Um, other people feel that the walk-through car is better. The one that we're negotiating to build for Seattle is a walk-through car, so you'll be able to get from one car to the other without having to go out on the platform. Now, another claim that the Cascadia Monorail makes is they have faster loading times and access to open seats. And then let's get that picture up that you took. Here sure. Uh, well, a lot of people feel that that if you have a walk-through car, then you can a walk-through train, then you can load on any of the cars and move to the front or the back of the train. Mm -hmm. And so, in terms of balancing the load and allowing people to distribute themselves through the train, many people think that the walk-through is better. You know, both trains are great trains. We happen to be negotiating to buy the one that's walk-through. Now, will there be an online ticket purchasing system? Because the Las Vegas Monorail already, they have an online ticket purchasing system that seems to be just great. Well, we're working with all of the transit agencies in the Puget Sound to be part of the smart card system. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that would take longer than we have, but it's a, mm -hmm. an exciting system where you'll be able to get a smart card and go onto buses or light rail or monorail and go between all of our systems with one card. Uh, the next claim is that it's durable trains with a sustainable design. And then I went on the Hitachi site and got pictures of three different uh, of cars that Hitachi has now. And so if we can just quickly go through them, which of those three cars, if any, are we looking at today? I think the, uh, the, the train that, you sh that we showed in the video mm -hmm. that was going back and forth is much closer to the design that we'll be getting, the, the two-car train. Um, and personally, uh, we think that the design of that train with the nose that they've put on it is very nice, and that's much closer to the design than these. Another advantage that Cascadia Monorail claims is the flexibility to increase passenger capacity without additional station construction costs. That says to me they just add trains, add cars. Yeah, what they say on their website is that you can add a third car to the train. And so in the future, if we need more capacity, right now we're sizing it for uh, to be able to carry riders you know, 20, 30, 40 years into the future. But if at that time, um, there are a number of things you can do. One of the things they mention in their website is adding another car to that train in the future. Now, next thing is a, is a map of Las Vegas's route. And mm -hmm. the reason that we have that, if we can go to the inset, is that it shows that uh, the monorail there and monorails around the world are able to go at some very difficult angles. Mm -hmm. Is that something that down the road you may be looking at? Well, if you think about it, we have some interesting turns ourselves as you go from fifth to Stewart, as you turn west on Stewart, and then again we take a turn on to second, a turn to the south on second. We have two uh, turns that we're making through the middle of our downtown. Mm. We can't do a monorail show without some scenes of Sydney. I understand you were just there recently. Here are <laughs> some scenes from the Darling Harbor area. Um, actually. Does that monorail work inside that very, very large city? You know, it's a great monorail. It, it carries about three and a half million people a year. It's smaller than our monorail, a um, little bit older technology. You know, it was actually used in the World's Fair up in Vancouver and then was moved to Sydney. Um, and, it, and it works well, and for that city, it seems to be doing a great job. 20 seconds left. Uh, Elevated.org is the website, but Joel, I want to ask you one final question. Sure. Is there anything that's going to stop this from happening? 
Boy, that's a tough question. I sure hope not. Um, we're doing everything in our power to make sure it's built, and it's going to be something that you and I and everybody else are very proud of. And I'll tell you, I think in 10 years, what people are going to say about the monorail is I cannot believe we could ever consider having a city without one. Joel, thank you very much for being with us. So that was Joel Horn, the executive director of the uh, Seattle Monorail Authority. Go to the website, www.elevated.org. You're going to find out a lot more information. Next week, right here on Public Exposure, Marvin Taylor of Health Emergent International Services, bringing health care to Afghanistan. We'll see you then.